I'm so glad to be with you this morning. It's such a wonderful thing. Thank you so much. I know I'm right next to a Marine base. <laughs> I spent 36 and a half years in the Army. Any of you that have ever heard me speak anywhere, you know that I always have to find out how many Marines I have in the audience. <laughs> how many of you are Marines? There we go. Okay, we got some Marines. All right. This is what I normally do. I asked for one of you Army people to go sit next to a Marine <laughs> so that if I use any complicated words, you can explain to them what it means. <laughs> okay? It's the only thing I ask. Now, let me, I, I, you know, I get in trouble for, with this. I, I, in fact, the other night, I was, uh, Friday night, I was speaking at uh, Costa Mesa and Pastor Chuck Smith's church at a prophecy conference there, and, I, and they gave me a Marine as an escort. And let me tell you what happened. You know, I always tell Marine jokes. I, I rented this little Mustang at the rental car place, and it was so small that when I was getting in it, I ripped the seat out of my pants. <laughs> and there I was at a conference with 1,500 people, plus it was being broadcast on the webcast, and I had the whole seat out of my pants. <laughs> and this Marine said, I have some duct tape. <laughs> I went up there with duct tape on my pants, and I didn't tell any Marine jokes, but I, my, I put on a new pair of pants this morning, so I got to tell you this one Marine joke. <laughs> this Marine in Quantico, Virginia there came out of Quantico late one evening. He got off duty, and he went up into Old Town Alexandria right outside of Washington there, and he sat down in a bar. He was a, uh, Episcopal. He wasn't Baptist or anything. So he sat down at a bar. And they ordered a beer, and in comes a Navy SEAL and sits down right next to him. It was right before 10 o'clock at night. The news was just getting ready to come on. And, and this, they looked up, and the TV came on with the nightly news. And here's a guy standing on the ledge of a building. And he's looking down at the cameras, and he's yelling, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump and kill myself. So the... The SEAL looked over at the Marine, and he said to the Marine, Hey, you think that guy's going to jump? The Marine said, No way. The SEAL pulled out 20 bucks, laid it on the bar, and said, I bet you 20. The Marine reached in his pocket, pulled out 20, and said, No way, I'll take that bet. He laid his 20 next to it, and about that time, the guy did a swan dive right to the sidewalk, splat, <laughs> killed him. The Marine said, Oh, man. Boy, that was a quick 20 bucks. He slid it over to the seal. The seal looked at him and smiled and said, No, nah, man. He said, Ah, keep your money. He said, I can't take it. He said, I saw that on the 5 o'clock news. <laughs> Wait a minute. You know what the Marine said? The Marine said, Yeah, I did too, but I didn't think he'd be dumb enough to jump a second time. <laughs> I love the Marines. My dad spent 32 years with the Marine Corps, so that's my secret. I, uh, I'm going to start with something that uh, I normally don't start with, but I, I want to tell you something. I, my wife was supposed to be here with me. We, we got a picture of me with this lay on and this, this shirt that I just went out and bought last night just so I could stand here and look like the rest of you. <laughs> she was supposed to be with me. Um, we are starting a new ministry. My ministry is called Kingdom Warriors. You can find us at kingdomwarriors.net. And my wife was supposed to be here with me today uh, for ministry in California and ministry here. And uh, as I was in meetings this week on this new ministry that we're standing up, which is a ministry to take military special operations people that are leaving the military and send them into the parts of the world where the gospel has never been preached. We're going to go into the darkest parts of the world and and preach the gospel with these men that are stepping forward saying, here am I, send me. And uh, 
I came out of the second day of meetings down at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I had a, had a phone voice message that my wife had just rolled her car and totaled it. And uh, I have to tell you the story. I'm telling you this because the enemy will not stop me. And I'm going to tell you of God's grace and mercy. She was hit from the side and rolled. She woke up in the, in the car hanging in her seat belt while the car was over on the side and, and the car was filling up with smoke and she began to say, God, what am I going to do? How am I going to get out of here? And all of a sudden a voice was tap, tapping on the window and the voice was saying, ma'am, open the window. She opened the window and a man pulled her out, unbuckled her seat belt and literally pulled her out over a car that was laying on its side. Got her on the ground and said, are you okay? And she said, yes, I'm okay. And when the ambulance got there, the, the man was gone. The man wasn't around. Now, whether he was human or whether he was divine, what I know is God sent him to spare my wife. And I want you, I want you all to know that uh, she wanted to be here with us today, but she couldn't be because of her, her neck and her back are sore, but she didn't have a scratch on her, not a mark. And I want to give God thanks this morning. I want to personally give God thanks this morning in this service to all of you and say thank you, Lord, for protecting my wife. And I also want to say, God, I'm going forward with whatever you call me to do. And nothing the enemy can bring against me will stop me. On the 15th of October, 2003, Tom Brokaw aired a program on the nightly news that went something like this. Brokaw said, NBC News has learned that the Pentagon has a new three-star general. His name is Jerry Boykin. He's the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. And his job is to find the enemies of America, like Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden and Zarqawi and Zawahiri and all the other heads of terrorist organizations. And he would ostensibly be the perfect man for this job. And then he went on to give my qualifications as being a founding member of the Delta Force and all of those things, a tour at the Central Intelligence Agency, wounded in battle and so forth. And then he went, he took a different direction. He said, however, in a secret investigation, NBC News has learned that there's another side to this general that might disqualify him for this job. And that is that he's an evangelical Christian, and that's what your pastor is talking about. I think Wednesday night I'm going to tell that story. But let me tell you something. That began the most painful period of my life as they went after me over my faith. And uh, what I came to understand is that people like Tom Brokaw and, the, and many, many people don't understand my faith. They don't understand your faith. They don't understand the Christian faith. And uh, I want to tell you why my faith is what it is today. I, I do have a lot of faith. I, it's been challenged. It's been tested. It's been put through the fire, but I do have a lot of faith. You see, I'm a founding member of the Army's Delta Force. In uh, the 6th of January, 1978, I'd just returned to my home uh, in Eglin Air Force Base, uh, where I was an instructor in the Florida Ranger Camp. And I got a call from a guy, and the guy said, I'm calling you from the Army Personnel Center in Washington. He said, Captain Boykin, I'm going to ask you to volunteer for a new unit that's being formed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He didn't tell me what the name of the unit was. He just said, all I can tell you is this. It's very secretive. We'll bring you to Fort Bragg and put you through a 30-day trial. If you make it through this trial at the end of that 30 days, we'll ask you to volunteer for a, an assignment with this new unit. And he said, the only thing I can tell you is you need to be in the best physical condition you've ever been in. And then he looked, he, he said to me on the phone, he said, and by the way, I need your answer by 4.30 this afternoon. Well, the two things that struck me, one was, if you make it. The second thing was, I've got to have your answer right away. I then did the thing that I always do when I'm confronted with a dilemma, and some of you that have heard me speak, you know exactly what it was. What do you think I did? No. I yeah, say, that's what most audiences say. You pray. No, I call my mother. <laughs> Listen, moms, if you want to leave a legacy for your children, let them see you pray. There's nothing more important for you, moms and dads, than to let your children see you pray. I still, my mother has Alzheimer's. I still call her today. I called her the other day when my wife rolled her car. Her spirit doesn't have Alzheimer's, and she still prays. You see? My mother was a praying woman. She began to pray for me on the phone. She said, son, I'll be praying for you that if this is where God wants you to be, he'll give you what you need to get through this process in the next 30 days. 
She prayed on the phone and she said, I'll continue to pray. I reported to Fort Bragg the first week of February in 1978. And they issued us a bunch of equipment and then they took us up into the mountains. It was the dead of winter, snow everywhere. And then they put us out in those woods in the mountains there and right by ourselves, each man individually doing his own thing, walking mile after mile after mile every single day, never knowing how far we had to go, never knowing how long the day would be, having to figure out how we were going to get from point A to point B, just walking with very heavy loads on our back and uh, an AK-47 and load-bearing equipment, just walking through those mountains. And as I'd walk, I'd pray, God, if this is what you want me to do, give me the strength to make it through this. One day I fell in a creek trying to jump it, and I, I pants and boots and everything froze my feet went numb my legs went numb and I just kept walking and praying God don't let me be injured God give me the strength to make it at the end of the day I was just fine but one day I was hopelessly lost I stopped took my rucksack off just looked up in heaven and said Lord in the name of Jesus lead me to where I need to be I have no idea where I am in Jesus name put my rucksack on walk right straight to where I was supposed to be the last day in those mountains I walked 40 miles that was the final test, 40 miles through the mountains. 40 miles with about 70 pounds on my back in the snow through the mountains, never left my feet, and I was the first one through. Now look, my wife calls me studly. <laughs> but I ain't studly enough on my own power to walk 40 miles in the mountains with 70 pounds on my back in 11 hours and 27 minutes, and that's what I did. 11 hours and 27 minutes, first man through. Well, when I got through, they put us on a truck, they brought us all back down to Fort Bragg, took us in a room, and a psychologist began to give us a, a battery of tests, and of, of every test known to man, every psychological test you can think of. And when he got through, first of all, did, is there anybody that's a psychologist in here? Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Normally, if there's a psychologist, I ask them to come forward and let us pray for them that they'll be delivered. This little psychologist brought me in this room after testing me and evaluating my test results, sat me down, looked across the table at me, and he said, Captain Boykin, I'm going to recommend against you being part of this organization. I said, why? He said, well, you're not self-reliant enough. Now, I want you to think about the fact that I just walked through the mountains with 70 pounds on my back, 40 miles and 11 miles and 27 minutes, and, and, and this little uh, squirt was sitting across the table from me saying you're not self-reliant enough. What he was really saying was you depend too much on your faith. And you know what was going through my mind? And I'm still a work in progress pastor, but what was going through my mind was and I bet you depend on that nose which I'm just about ready to break. <laughs> but I've grown a lot since then. He said, I'm going to recommend against you. That was on a Friday afternoon. Now, look, I got in my vehicle. It was the first time we'd had a break in 30 days. I got in my vehicle. I drove down to my home in eastern North Carolina, down by the Marine Base, Cherry Point, down there, where my dad was. I went to my mom. I said, Mom, I know you've been praying. What does the Lord, what's he laid on your heart? What do you feel as you're praying? What's God saying to you? And my mom said, Son, I don't know what this means. She said, I want you to understand that I do not know what this means, but as I've prayed, what I have felt in my spirit is that Satan is gathering his forces. Let me make a couple points. First is, Satan's real. You know, there's a lot of people that don't want you to think that Satan's real. A lot of people use the term, you know, sort of euphemistically for evil. It's not a synonym with evil. It's not a metaphor for evil. Satan's a real person. This Bible that tells you about God tells you about Satan. He's real. But a lot of people in this country today... A lot of preachers in this country today never preach about the realities of Satan. Therefore, they don't understand. The congregations don't understand the concept of spiritual warfare. You see, we're up against him every single day. I'm not here to glorify him, but I'm here to tell you that he is indeed real, and he is a real enemy, and we're fighting him every single day. My mother said Satan is gathering his forces. That scared me. I didn't know what to say. I was really frightened. That Sunday morning, I got down on my knees in that church that I grew up in there, and Eastern North Carolina, an old church with hard wooden pews that when I was a kid, it was so hard to sleep on those pews. You know? <laughs> and in fact, as an adult, it was hard to sleep on those pews. And I began to pray, and I began to say, God, Satan is gathering his forces. What do you want me to do, God? Satan is gathering his forces. And all of a sudden, I heard the voice of the Lord. Now you say, oh, 
Oh, you heard God's voice. Well, yeah, I did. And there's people in here right now. I guarantee you, you've heard God's voice. Now, was it audible? I don't know. It was audible to me. I don't think anybody around me heard it, but it was audible to me. Maybe it was just in my spirit. I don't know. I heard God's voice. As I was sitting, I was down on my knees praying in, the, in that little church there, and uh, I said, Satan is gathering his forces, and I heard the voice of the Lord say, yes, son, but so am I. And I knew that I was to go back and be part of this new unit that was being formed. I went back to Fort Bragg Sunday afternoon. Monday morning, I was sitting in a, in a chair, and in a semicircle in front of me was the commander of this new Delta Force and his, the officers that he had already selected. And they were bombarding me with questions. It was the board. It was the commander's board. And they were bombarding me with questions, one right after the other. There was no right and wrong answers. They just wanted to see how I was going. And the guy that formed the Delta Force was an old colonel named Charlie Beckles, one of the most cantankerous, hard-living, hard-cursing, hard-drinking old guys I've ever seen, legendary in special operations. Got shot in the belly in Vietnam with a 50 caliber and survived it. And this guy was hard. And all of a sudden, you know, this crusty old guy just said, everybody stop. He looked at me and he said, Captain, I said, you're a man of faith, aren't you? I said, yes, Colonel, I am. He said, were you raised that way? And I said, Colonel, my mother's a saint. He just looked there around for a minute and he said, you know what? He said, Mine was too. He said, you know what? We'd be glad to have you in the Delta Force. And I thought, hey, I knew that yesterday, old man. <laughs> You're a day late. But let me tell you something. <laughs> for the next two years, that guy made life absolutely miserable for me. I'm not kidding. I thought the guy absolutely hated me. He was harder on me than anybody else. And you know why? I finally figured it out. You know why? Because a Christian had let him down somewhere along the line. Somebody that talked the talk, but when the chips were down, they didn't walk the walk. And he was looking for truth. He wanted to see if I really was what I said I was, if I could live my faith, because he had seen too many that couldn't. He'd seen too many in his time that talked it, but they didn't walk it. They didn't live it. And I thought the guy absolutely hated me. He was so hard on me. I thought, God, am I supposed to be here? The man hates me. And then, on the night of the 23rd of April, 1980, Jimmy Carter had told us to go into a place called Tehran, Iran, and re rescue 53 Americans that were being held by the Ayatollah Khomeini. It was the beginning of the Islamic Revolution 30 years ago, when the Ayatollah came back and his followers seized the American embassy and took 53 of our hostages. We were in a place called Wadi Kenya, Egypt, in an old Russian MiG hangar out in the middle of the desert. Beckwith walked up to me, looked me in the eye, and he said, Jerry, before we launch this operation tomorrow morning, would you ask the Lord to go with us? Would you ask him for his protection? I said, Colonel, I'll do it. I had passed his test. I'd met his standard for a Christian, and I rejoiced. The next morning, I stood up on a platform about that high in that old Russian MiG hangar, we got our men around. I read from the Bible. Isaiah 6, 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. You know what? God's calling every one of you. He's calling you to some kind of ministry in your workplace, in your family, in your community. God's calling you all to a ministry. There's two questions there. Whom shall I send? That's God's choice. But who will go for us? That's our choice. Will we go where God sends us? into the workplace, into the community. Well, and then I began to pray, God, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to protect these men. We bowed our heads reverently. Lord, we're going into a, midi, a city of five million people and there's only a hundred of us. In Jesus' name, we ask you to protect us and bring us home to our families. In the name of Jesus, we said. And then we sang, God bless America. And we launched our operation. We took off, headed into Iran right after dark. We launched that operation out of a little island out in the Persian Gulf there, off the coast of Oman. And sometime that night, about 100 miles from Tehran, we landed out in a remote part of the desert. Landed in C-130s and brought helicopters, RH-53s, Navy minesweepers. Brought them off the carrier, USS Nimitz. They came in, tucked right up in behind the C-130s as they sat on the desert floor there. 
we rolled big hoses out and we started refueling those helicopters. And as the helicopters would refuel, they'd pick up and move out of the way so the next helicopter could come in and then we were supposed to get in the helicopters and go forward to the embassy to rescue our, our hostages there. And the Marine crew in one of those helicopters, as they started to lift off in the dark and the dust and the confusion, the pilot went vertigo, he lost it, he lost control of it, and he crashed right into the C-130. And I couldn't have been more than 100 feet from it. And the flame, it, it, was, it had exploded into a huge ball of fire. And just fire, uh, flames coming under the aircraft, flames going over the aircraft. In fact, I saw a picture years later. You couldn't even tell it was two airplanes out there in the desert. And it was just a huge ball of fire. And I turned to run as those flames came at me. I turned to run, and as I turned to run, I felt the Holy Spirit saying to me, Stop. Stop. I stopped, and I spun around, and this is when I realized that 45 of those men that had stood in that desert in Wadi Kenya, Egypt, and prayed for God to go with them, to keep them in his hands. 45 of them were trapped in that burning wreckage. They were sitting on fuel bladders that still had fuel in them, fumes everywhere. I knew they were going to die. I knew there was nothing that I could do. They were hopelessly trapped in that burning wreckage. And the only thing I could do was reach out to the Almighty. And I began to pray. I stood in that desert with those flames just coming all over. And I just said, God, in the name of Jesus, they trusted you. Almighty Father, let them live in Jesus' name. I knew there was nothing I could do. But let me tell you, as I stood there praying, and I'm sure I was not the only one praying. I bet you there were 45 men inside that aircraft that were praying too. But all of a sudden, the right troop door on that C-130 opened. And through the flames, they're right through the flames, came 45 men in a dead run, just running for their lives. And the heat was so intense that it literally melted the nylon load-bearing equipment off some of those guys. That's how hot it was in there. But those 45 men, not one man that stood in that desert in Wadi Kenya, Egypt, and prayed for God to go with us was harmed. One guy had real pretty hair. You know, he was real proud of it, and they'd let him grow it out and all that and grow his beard. It, it singed his hair, and we had a lot of fun with that because he had a big place right up here with no hair in it where it was all burned off. But he wasn't hurt. You remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Remember that? Remember what Nebuchadnezzar said? Nebuchadnezzar jumped up, ran over there, and looked in the fire, and he said, Yo! I think he talked that way. He said, yo, didn't we throw three in there? And I see four. And the fourth one looks like the Son of God. You know, that was the pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ. I'm not a theologian, but I do know enough to know that was a pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ in that fire with him. And I don't know whether it was Jesus, whether it was the Holy Spirit, or whether it was angels, or whether it was all of them that was in that C-130 that night. But I know he spared 45 men that had stood before him reverently and said, God, go with us. He brought him out of that fire that night. See, Tom Brokaw didn't understand why my faith is strong. But Tom Brokaw didn't see what I saw in that desert that night as those 45 men came through that fire. In 1983, the president told us to go into an island called Grenada and to rescue 1,000 American medical students and take that island away from us, uh, the Cubans and the communists, and turn it back over to the people of Grenada. As we got ready to launch that operation, we were in our base there at Fort Bragg, and, and uh, we were scurrying around, getting ready to go, and all of a sudden, one of those sergeants that had been trapped in that fire came up to me, looked me right in the eye, and he said, Sir, we ain't leaving until you pray. I said, God bless you. Get them all together. They got all together. I stood up on the loading dock there. Everybody put his arms around his brother, and we began to pray, God, in Jesus' name, we ask you to go with us. Be with us. Give us success and protect us and bring us home to our families in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we sang, God bless America. We got in our aircraft and we launched the next morning. Just as the sun came up, we came across the blue waters of the Caribbean. Just beautiful, just beautiful blue water. It came on the island of Grenada and, and it, it, in some ways it looks a lot like uh, Hawaii here in a a very tropical environment there. The people down in the jungle waving at us said, this is going to be a great day. And then all of a sudden I looked down and we were coming in on our target, coming in fast. I was in the lead Black Hawk. There were six Black Hawks. I was in the first Black Hawk. I looked down and we were going in on a prison, a place called Richmond Hill Prison, where they had a bunch of political prisoners and we were going to rescue them because they were going to be part of the new government that was being formed. And as we came in on there, we were coming in fast, coming in hot, and all of a sudden... Literally, hell broke loose. 
and they started firing at us. Red tracers and green tracers, and I saw them coming from both sides and coming off the nose of the aircraft. Then I heard a popping sound, and I realized it was those rounds going through the rotor blades, and all of a sudden it felt like somebody hit me with a two-by-four, boom, boom, and I had been hit up in the side of my chest, and, and a 50 caliber round went right up through my armpit. That didn't, the doctor said later that the one that went into my chest did not penetrate the lungs, but I thought they'd shot my arm off, and I, I reached over to stop the bleeding, and when I did, I, I realized I still had an arm, and no feeling, no use. I picked it up and laid it across my lap, we made another circle, went back in again, got shot out a second time, and we headed for a carrier. They took me out, dropped me off on a carrier out there, went right into surgery. They operated on me there, brought me out of surgery. I had these two gaping holes, no armpit left, big hole in the side of my chest. They put me on a C-141, flew me back to Fort Bragg, right into surgery, came out of surgery, opened my eyes in the recovery room, and here's these doctors and nurses standing there and we got any doctors in here let me tell you what they said this was their diagnosis uh, you know I'm still you know kind of bleary eyed and I look up and they said captain you have a very serious injury <laughs> I said no can't be true I got two gaping holes in me I've been bleeding for over two days and that you know, I can't use my arm. And they said, sir, the bone in your arm right at the shoulder has been shattered. It's been shot completely in two. Uh, and they said, in about six to eight months, we don't want to open you up again, but in six to eight months, we'll go back in there and we can put you a plate in there with some screws. But th then they looked at me and said, the problem is you're never going to use your arm again. And they said, the reason is the nerve is gone in your arm you're never going to use it again. Now, I found out years later from a, a, another doctor friend of mine that was there said, they want to take your arm off. But I told them, don't even ask him because he'll never agree to it. So they didn't even ask me. But they said, you're never going to use it again. So we're going to have to talk about, you know, long term. What they were saying long term was a medical board to put you out of the Army. You know what? At the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and I didn't hear God's voice, but I felt the Holy Spirit prompting me. You know what the Holy Spirit said to me? That you, you say, I mean, I, I speak to a lot of audiences, and they say, oh, my gosh, man thinks God talks to him. Well, God does talk to me. In fact, God talks to all of us. The problem is we don't hear it sometimes because we don't listen or because we don't trust that God's speaking to us. But God does speak to us. And I felt the Holy Spirit prompt me. I looked at those doctors I laid there in that bed, and I said, you do anything you need to. Do your very best because God will heal me. And I was confident. I knew God was going to heal me. Well, they didn't know what to do. So they put me in this thing. It was the awfulest thing you've ever seen. It was a cast. And it started here and it came all the way up here. And then it went all the way around my body. And then they had a broomstick that went from here to here. So here, this is the way I had to walk. I couldn't lay down. I'd go home. I'd sit. And let me tell you something. It, I, it, it is unbelievable how painful it was. I mean, it was terrible. People say, I didn't sleep for three days. I'm, I didn't sleep for three days because I was in constant, unbelievable pain. And it's, it's unbelievable that you could suffer that kind of pain. And, and everywhere I go, some woman comes up and says, well, sir, you've never had a baby. <laughs> this is my response, ladies. If it hurt as bad as that did, don't have any more babies. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I, and this is what I did. Now, I know nobody in here has done this, but this is what I did. I said, why me, Lord? Why did you let this happen to me? Why me? You know what? He did not answer that question. So then I went to one of these, and I am not joking about this. I really did say this to God. I, then I went to this. I said, Lord, maybe you forgot that I led the prayer. <laughs> he was not impressed with that. Then I said... And if you don't heal me, it's going to look so bad for you. <laughs> he didn't answer that, but let me tell you what did happen. A letter came, my wife opened it and handed it to me, and it was from a guy I grew up with. The man was like a brother to me, and this is what he said. He said, Brother, I know you're asking God why. Whew, boy, he was reading my mind. And he said, I can't answer why. But he said, I'll tell you this. Before this happened to you, 
He said, I walked away from the commitment I made to Jesus Christ. I'd gone back to living the way I did before. And he said, when this happened to you, it broke me. He said, I fell on my face before God. I repented of the way I'd been living, and I asked God to forgive me. And I've asked him to heal you, and I believe he's going to heal you. You know what? That's the only answer I needed. Why me? Why me? I don't know the whole story, but I know that one thing brought my brother back into harmony with Jesus Christ. That's the only answer I needed. They said you're never going to heal. You're never going to use that arm again. That's a long story, and I could tell you the whole thing, but let me tell you this. That's the arm. That's the arm that they were going to take off. I swing a golf club. I shoot a bow. I play my guitar. I hug my children, and I bench press more today than I did when I was playing football at Virginia Tech back in the 60s with an arm they were going to take off. See, Tom Brokaw doesn't understand my faith. Tom Brokaw doesn't understand why I believe the way I believe and what I believe. He didn't live through a miraculous healing. Those churches, those pastors that tell you that God doesn't perform miracles anymore, set them straight. Help them out because he does perform miracles. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He healed me. I know he healed me. Look at this. You see how short that hand? Can you guys see that? You see that? See how much shorter that is? You got any golfers in here? If you got a bad slice, brother, take a half inch off your left arm. <laughs> Man, that'll give you a hook like you've never seen. That's exactly what I got. 1989, the president told us to go into Panama. He said, take that country away from a Satan worshiper named Manuel Noriega and turn it back over to the people of Panama. As we got ready to go launch our operation, we were standing in our hangar at Howard Air Force Base getting ready to launch. And we got everybody together, put our arms around each other, and we lifted ourselves up to God. And we said, God, in the name of Jesus, go with us, be with us, keep your hands on us, and bring us home to our families. Give us success in this mission in Jesus' name. And we sang, God bless America. And we launched that operation. Friends, when we came across that canal, I was in a Black Hawk again. When we came across that canal, it was a flash bike. They opened up on us out of those big old high-rise buildings there in Panama City, protecting our target, which was Carcel Modelo Prison. And it, uh, here they come again, red tracers coming from every direction, and I just had a flashback. I said, not again. Well, we dropped down. We got under those tracers, and we went right in on the top of that prison, landed on top of that prison, blew a hole in the top of the prison, went down into the third floor, and ran down the hallway and got to the cell block of a man named Kurt Muse. Kurt Muse has a wonderful book out called Six Minutes to Freedom, and he tells about how we rescued him. He was a man that was running a clandestine radio station supported by the CIA and the Panamanians caught him and locked him up. He'd been in, he'd been in jail for months and our first task was to rescue him and bring him home. Before we did anything else, rescue him and get him out of there and bring him home. We blew the door off his cell, went in there and got Kurt Muse, took him out up to the roof, took him up and put him in a little helicopter, one of these little Hughes 500s, 530s, with people sitting out on the pods outside the helicopter, holding on, and took off off the roof and started down through the streets of Panama City and all of a sudden started taking fire from every direction. And the helicopter was hit, lost its hydraulics, and crashed right in the middle of the street. Now listen, it shot one guy in the leg, another guy got a, a round in the chest, the helicopter crashed and crashed on the toes of another guy, pinned him under the helicopter. He lost his toes trying to get out of there so he could get out of the line of fire. Literally lost three of his toes when he just finally pulled his foot out. And another guy jumped out of the helicopter and started to run, and the rotor blades came around and hit him right in the head. He had a helmet on it. Hit him in the head and knocked him right out in the street. Look, it should have killed every one of those guys when that helicopter went down. I'm telling you, every one of them survived. They all survived. And they all went back to full duty. Every one of them went back to duty. And the guy lost his toes. He ran a half marathon six months later, missing three toes. That's how good God is. That, see, Tom Brokaw doesn't understand my faith because Tom Brokaw wasn't there. He didn't see what I saw. He didn't see the hand of God. He didn't see the miraculous way that God honors his children. And then in August of 1993, President Bill Clinton told us to go into a place called 
Mogadishu, Somalia. You know the events as Black Hawk Down. Some of you have no doubt seen the movie or, or read the book or both. He told us to go in there and uh, capture a man named Muhammad Fari Adid. Adid was the clan leader of the Habagitter clan. Adid was an evil man, a, a demonic Muslim who wanted to control all of Somalia, starting with the capital city of Mogadishu. He and his militia were brutal, evil people. And in one operation, Muhammad Adid and his militia killed 24 Pakistani peacekeepers that were just out there trying to feed hungry people. And it was at that point where the United Nations said, that's enough. Get him, bring him to The Hague, we're going to try him. So they sent us into Mogadishu, called us Task Force Ranger. We did have Rangers with us. And they sent us in and they said, bring him to justice. When I got off the plane on that airfield in Mogadishu, I'm telling you folks, I felt the presence of evil. You felt the pre I felt the presence of evil. You ever talk to a missionary that's been into places like Haiti where witchcraft is so heavily practiced? They'll tell you, your missionaries will tell you, you feel the presence of it. You know how you feel God's Holy Spirit when the, this worship team is up here or, or God's moving? You feel God's Holy Spirit. You can feel the presence of evil too. I knew I was in a bad place. I knew it was an evil place with so much Islamic fanaticism. It was an evil place that was inhabited by what Jesus himself called the prince of this world. You ever think about it? John 12 and John 16, Jesus himself calls Satan the prince of this world. He's real. Well, I had a little chaplain there with me. I got that chaplain together. We set up a little makeshift chapel, and we started holding services to share the gospel, to share the love of Jesus Christ with all those troops there. And we, we began worshiping there, and then we got ready to launch our operations, and we got everybody together in the hangar there, and we read from the scriptures, and we prayed, God, be with us. Keep us in your hands and bring us home to our families in the name of Jesus. And we sang, God bless America. And we started launching operations. The problem with the movie Black Hawk Down is you only see one day's operation. You don't see that we went into that city six times. And let me tell you something. We went in against some tough oppositions. We got into some bad fights. Not, not unlike some of the fights that our troops have gotten into in Afghanistan and Iraq. In fact, we got in... Uh, some fights that killed a lot of uh, Somalis. I'm not proud of that. I'm just telling you. It's a reality. We killed a lot of Somalis in these six operations, but we were unscathed. I had w one guy that got a couple of Band-Aids on his leg, and every time we'd come back into our base there on that airfield at Mogadishu, I'd just give God the glory. I would say, God, thank you. In Jesus' name, thank you for blessing us and being with us. And then the 3rd of October... It was my mother's birthday, and it was a beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, and I, I wanted to call my mother and tell her happy birthday and from Mogadishu. It, we started getting intelligence that Adid's lieutenants were having a meeting down in a place called the Bakara Market. And, uh, and some of his closest allies and, and supporters were meeting there, and we were ordered to go into the Bakara Market. To, Car market is the worst part of Mogadishu. It was a place we did not want to go. We had stayed out of the Bakara market deliberately because it was the heart of the Habegitter clan. There was a hotel there called the Olympic Hotel, which was where the militia was housed. And our target was right across the street from the Olympic Hotel. We didn't want to go in there, but we got the order. And right before I launched that operation, I Got out of my seat. I got down on my knees just as I had before every operation, right in front of everybody. And I said, in the name of Jesus, go with us, protect us, and bring us home to our families. The code word to launch that operation was Irene. When I got up off my knees, I grabbed the handset, and I said, Irene, Irene, Irene. And all of a sudden, you could hear the rotoblades turning, black hawks and little birds. 
and they started lifting off. They went out over the ocean, made a, a circle out over the ocean, and they headed inbound for the Bacara market. And in the next 10 minutes, we were in a fight for our lives. Toughest fight the United States military had been in since Vietnam. And for 18 hours, we fought for our lives. And 18 hours after I said, Irene, 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 15 of my soldiers were dead. And I remember standing at our, our operations center and looking at a small, just a small black and white television as CNN International showed the bodies of five of those 18, or those 15 men, as the wild-eyed, drug-crazed Somalis dragged their bodies through the streets and poked them with sticks and mutilated them and desecrated them and did other horrible things that we've never even told the families about. And all I could say was, where is God? Where is God? Why has this happened? Where is God? My most vivid memory of Mogadishu, as I, as I write about in my book there, and I know many of you have read it, was a five-ton truck, which was the only, only thing we had to get, get those guys out 18 hours later. A five-ton truck came back into our base on the airfield there, and we had the, the dead in, on the bottom. And on top of the dead, we had our wounded. We had 76 wounded in addition to 15 dead. We had the wounded stacked up on top of them. And as I saw that coming in on that airfield, I just, my heart broke. And I walked over to that truck and I walked over to help drop the tailgate on it so we could unload our dead and wounded. And when somebody reached it before I did, and when they dropped that tailgate, the blood poured out the back of that truck like water. And that was the blood of my soldiers, folks. And all I could do was stand there and do everything I could to hold my emotions together as I said, where is God? Where is God? Where is God? We evacuated our dead and wounded. We, uh, and that night I, after the sun went down, I went over and sat down on my bunk where no one could see me. It was dark and, and I just began to weep. And the longer I wept, the harder I wept until finally my chest was just heaving. I was sobbing. I was out of control because I was saying, where is God? And then this is what I said. I said, there is no God. There is no God. I was so hurt and so broken that the only answer I could come up with was there is no God. Now, you know what? Some of you say, what? You denied God? Yeah, I did. And you know what? There's a guy in the Bible that denied God three times in a span of an hour, a guy named Peter. You know what the book of Acts says? The book of Acts says that he went on to preach a sermon that won 3,000 people to the kingdom of God after denying him three times around the fire that night. The moment I said there is no God, for the second time and the last time in my life, I heard the voice of the Lord just as audible as, as if I was talking to you. And this is what he said. Very simple but very profound. I said there is no God. And the voice of the Lord said to me, if there's no God, there's no hope. You think about that. If there's no God, there's no hope. There is no hope. There's no hope for any of us. No, no hope. And I immediately said, God, I am sorry. I am so sorry that I doubted you. You know what the great thing about it is? The God that we serve, there is absolutely nothing you've ever done that he won't forgive. See, that's hard for a lot of people to come to grips with. You know, there's so many people that say, well, you don't know what I've done. Well, you don't know what I've done. And it doesn't matter. You see, there were three crosses on that hill that day. Remember, we, I wear a cross, you know. I, I, my wife gave it to me on her wedding day, and I, 
and I still wear it. The problem is it doesn't fully represent what occurred at Calvary that day. The fact of the matter is there were three crosses. And the guy on one side of him mocked him. The guy on the other side, Father, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? He didn't say, well, tell me what good works you've done. Uh, did you pay your tithes? Did you get baptized? Did you take communion? All of those things are important. You ought to do all of those things. But that ain't what's, that's not salvation. God forgave that man of his sins because he turned to him and said the most beautiful words in the Bible. He said, on this day, you'll be with me in paradise. What did that guy do that the other one didn't do? That guy recognized him as the Savior, as the only one that could give him a, a place in heaven. And that guy never got off that cross. He never did anything good. But he repented of his sins. And that's what it's all about. The moment I said, sitting there in Mogadishu, God, I'm sorry, he forgave me. In fact, he forgave me before it passed my lips while it was in my heart. He forgave me for that. Well, I said, God, I don't understand. I sat right there. I said, Lord, I'm sorry, but I don't understand what happened. I took my Bible. I said, Lord, this is how he speaks to me sometimes. I said, Lord, I'm going to open this Bible, and I want you to give me something that will help me to understand what happened here. I opened my Bible. I looked down. You know what it said? It said, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. That's what was marked in my Bible where I opened it. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. We can't understand everything. We don't have the mind of God. You see bad things happen. Why does God let bad things happen? I don't know. All I know that he's sovereign. And it serves his purpose. We don't blame Satan for bad things. We blame God. <clears throat> but how many times do we give him credit for the good things that happen? Well, I said, okay, God, I can't understand. That night, the next day, we had a memorial service. We uh, did a memorial service for all of our people that had been killed. And that night, just right after the sun went down, I'm talking to two of them. My lieutenant colonel, squadron commander, and my master sergeant, and I'm standing here talking to them, and a blast, a huge explosion went off right there. They were between me and the explosion. It hit us all, knocked us all down. Somebody told me I was knocked out for just a few seconds. I don't know. All I know is it was a mortar. Four mortars were fired. Three of them went in the ocean, and one landed, a short one, landed right there. And when I got to my feet, I looked down, and I knew this man was dead. My master sergeant was dead. I could see his brains on the ground. And I began to scream at God, no, God, I can't take any more. No, God. You ever been that way? You ever been to that point? You say, God, if you don't do something right now, just take me. Well, God knows what you can take, and he knows what serves his purpose. I can't explain it. You just have to accept it on faith that God knows your limits. My lieutenant colonel was laying right next to him just screaming, my legs, my legs, my legs, and the blood everywhere. There, were, there was one man dead and 15 more laying in a circle that had been hit by this mortar. They medevaced me up to, just up the hill to the uh, surgical unit. They operated on me that night. I had shrapnel in my feet and legs from the from the mortar, and the next morning I couldn't walk. I just said, take me back to the airfield. They took me back down to the airfield. They laid me on my bunk. And I said to the Lord, God, I know it's not for me to understand, but I want you to give me something that will help me to come to grips with what's happened here, that will help to ease my pain. And somebody walked up and handed me a facsimile, and the facsimile started in uh, Loveland, Colorado, by the guy that found a dollar rental car, a good Christian man been a good Christian brother to me. And he sent the facsimile to Fort Bragg, and then they, they forwarded it on to, uh, to Mogadishu, and they, they walk up and handed me this facsimile. In fact, my wife just found this thing the other day, and we've, we're going to frame it. And this is what it said. It said, <clears throat> it said uh, For they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40, 31. Wait upon, hope in. It means the same thing. For they that hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. God was telling me, your strength will be renewed. I came home the end of October, my first night home. I could not sleep. 
I went downstairs at 2.30 in the morning. I said to the Lord, God, I'm tormented. I know it's not for me to understand. I have to wait upon you. I have to hope in you. But give me something to ease my pain because I don't believe that all 16 of those men were ready to go into eternity and meet you. I said, I'm going to open this Bible and I want you to give me something. I opened the Bible and marked in my Bible was Romans 5.19, which said this. For as by one man's disobedience were many made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. It's an assurance that the sacrifice at Calvary gives everybody an opportunity to be with Jesus. But you know what else that scripture was saying to me? God was saying to me, were you obedient to me in Mogadishu? Did you share the gospel? Yes, Lord. And I felt... I felt God saying to me, I revealed myself to those men. I gave them a chance before they died, and they accepted me, and you'll see them again. I closed my Bible. I said to the Lord, Lord, just give me something to confirm what you've just showed me. I opened the Bible again, and this time I opened it to the book of John, and marked in my Bible was this. Said I not to thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou should see the glory of God. You know what the glory of God is that I will see? I'll see those 16 men again. I believe that. I believe God revealed himself to them. I believe they knew enough to accept him, and I believe they accepted him before they died. And I believe I'll see them in heaven because God saved them. I'm finishing with this. Again, some of you read the book. But I'm going to tell you this story anyhow because it's for purpose. When that mortar went off and we all went down, the first thing I did when I stood to my feet was I began to scream, find Dr. Marsh. Find Dr. Marsh. He was my unit surgeon. You know what? He was laying right next to me in a pool of blood. He had walked up to speak to me just as the mortar went off. And a, and a piece of that shrapnel hit him right here in the renal artery. Now, for those of you who have many medical experience, you know that's pretty serious. He was bleeding to death. Severed his renal artery right here in the groin, and he was laying there in the pool of blood. And I'm yelling, find Doc Marsh, and he's laying right next to me. They came over with two stretchers. They put me on a stretcher. They put Rob Marsh on a stretcher, and they took us into a little tent, just a little bitty tent, not as big as this room here, to a little bitty tent, and they laid us side by side, and I just I reached over and took his hand. He was unresponsive. They hooked up a blood pressure monitor. They hooked up a, a pulse machine. I could see them, big, uh, old-fashioned kind. But this is 93, but I could see them. I could tell what they're doing. And I could see he was losing, his blood pressure was ticking down and his pulse was going away. And I, I just held on to his hand, laying on the litter right next to him. And I just said, hey, Rob, buddy, you hold on, man. You're going to make it. And then I began to pray. And I said, God, don't, don't let him die in Jesus' name. Don't let him die. God, don't let this man die. And I just, I, every now and then I say, Rob, hold on, buddy. And they were working frantically on him. And I kept watching, and everything kept ticking away. And I'd say, Rob, hold on. And God, don't let him die in the name of Jesus. Don't let him die. And you know what? All of a sudden, he hadn't responded to me at all. You know, I'm holding his hand. All of a sudden, he opened his eyes. And he turned his head just a little bit to the right, and he looked right into my eyes. And, um, and I remember, like yesterday, the big dilated eyes of his. He looked right into my eyes, and he said, he said, you tell Barbara I love her. His eyes rolled back, and his lids closed, and he was gone. I watched the machines. The machines went to zero. Pulse went to zero. His blood pressure went to zero. He was gone. Tell Barbara I love her. It was the last thing he said to me. Barbara was his wife. And I, I said, no, God. Don't let him go, God. Don't let him die. The nurse, the nurse reached down and <clears throat> she took my hand and took his hand and she said, let him go. He's gone. Let go of his hand. He's gone. I couldn't let go of his hand. I just held on to his hand. I said, God, you are the author and the creator of life. Only you determine when it ends. God, in the name of Jesus, do not let this man die, please. I, 
I pray for a miracle in Jesus' name. She said, let him go. He's gone. And she tried, literally tried to pull my hand away from his. I said, God, don't let him die. My friends, that man today is, is practicing medicine in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, raising four kids and, and he, serving the Lord because of an almighty God. You think Tom Brokaw understands that? You think the world understands that? Don't tell me that miracles don't occur. I saw a man raised from the dead. I know what those machines said. They said he was dead. The nurse told me he was dead. I serve an almighty God. Why do I tell you that story? And I tell it to audiences all over. You know why I tell you that story? Because some of you have loved ones. You have family members. You have people in your neighborhood that you've been praying for. And they're still lost. I'm telling you, don't give up. Some of you are astute enough to know this country's in trouble. Our Constitution is being challenged like it has never been challenged before. And I'm telling you, we serve an almighty God. And as long as we reach over and grab the hand of the one that can make a difference, there's hope. As long as you can pray, you can rattle the gates of heaven. Do you have loved ones that are lost? Do you have friends that are lost? My mother prayed for my father for 50 years, praying that God would open his eyes and save his soul. I saw my dad go into eternity talking to God, saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. He and the Lord were having a conversation 50 years. Don't give up. That's my point. The name of my book is Never Surrender. Don't give up. Don't give up on this country. Don't give up on those people around you that are lost. You keep praying for them because as things get worse, there's a great harvest. I want to love you, love with all my heart. Your hope and love